Today on Basic Bytes, I will be showing you how to install a Zoom floppy from Retro Innovations on Windows 10 so that you can hook up your Commodore disk drives to your modern PC. This device will allow you to make disk images of your old 5 and a quarter inch floppy disks before they all inevitably fail. Or, alternatively, you can make physical disks from disk images that you download from the internet if that's your thing. Rumor has it that the new 2022 drivers are much simpler to install than the packages from several years ago. Let's put that to the test. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes. I recently acquired a Zoom floppy from Retro Innovations, and this is a device I've wanted for a while. The iron oxide coating on the thin plastic layer inside five and a quarter inch floppy disks from the 1980s isn't necessarily going to last another decade, and there are a number in my collection that I really want to get imaged before they all ultimately degrade and fail. The Zoom Floppy is one of two modern devices that can neatly accomplish the task. The other option was the Zoom 1541, noting that it is spelled X-U-M, not with a Z. I chose the Zoom Floppy for a couple of reasons, the first being that it's a well-established piece of hardware that has been sold by the same vendor consistently since 2010. It is therefore by no means a new piece of hardware, however my understanding is that the software and drivers for it have improved by leaps and bounds over the last couple of years, whereas most of the demonstration videos that I could find were from at least a half a decade ago, which is why I am making today's video. The other reason I chose the Zoom Floppy is simply because it was rather price competitive at $35, US, which a lot of the Zoom 1541s being sold by various makers on various auction sites could not compete with. This, by the way, is only about $45 Canadian. If you are going to be imaging disks from a PET drive, you are going to need to add an IEEE connector, which adds a few dollars to the price. However, since all of mine are IEC serial bus, that was not a requirement. The only thing I would caution about is that the Zoom Floppy comes exactly as you see it here in the product photo as a bare PCB. I will certainly be hacking together some kind of an El Cheapo case for mine in order to protect it from electrostatic discharge, and in the meantime, I shall also be very careful not to put it down on any electrically conductive surfaces. Resting the PCB down on top of your metal computer tower, for example, would indeed be a bad idea. The other thing to note here is that its USB connector is mini USB, not micro USB, or USB-C for that matter. So, if you are going to order one of these, make sure that you also have the correct cable on hand. The first thing we need to do is install the drivers and their accompanying software. The software that we're going to require is called OpenCBM. It's a package of core utilities as well as drivers for Zoom Floppy, Zoom 1541, and several other related devices. To obtain it, we go to the OpenCBM SourceForge, click on the Files tab, and then Download Latest Version, which as of this video is 0.4.99.104, released in January of 2022. Once you have that zip file, unzip it to a temporary folder of your choice. Now that I've unzipped OpenCBM into a temporary folder, let us see what it contains. In addition to the files needed for installation, there are two important pieces of documentation here, one of which is the OpenCBM manual, and the other of which is the Zoom Floppy manual. 
Note, however, that the Zoom Floppy manual has not been updated by its author since 2011. Thus, while it contains good information about the Zoom Floppy device itself, its descriptions of driver installations are falling out of date, referencing operating systems such as Windows XP and Windows 7. For that reason, in the event of any discrepancy between these two manuals, I have relied on the more up-to-date OpenCBM manual. According to the OpenCBM manual, we install the drivers using this install command, simply by typing install. The manual also notes that the installation script can be run multiple times if you encounter any errors or issues, but hopefully ours will be successful on the first go. Let's run this and see what happens. a success message that OpenCBM's installation is done and being asked if we wish to install the USB drivers, which of course we certainly do. So following the prompts, number one, attach your device, which I will plug in right now. Interestingly, even though this computer has never had a Zoom Floppy on it before, Windows 10 just gave me two notifications, the first saying that it was installing the Zoom Floppy, and the second saying that it was installed and ready to go. So clearly Windows 10 has natively detected this device as being something, but nonetheless, we are going to now hit Y at this prompt to continue to install the drivers that are in this package. And after a few moments of waiting, an alleged success, that's it, I am finished, press any key to continue, and there we go. According to the Zoom Floppy manual, there is one more thing that we want to do at this point, and that is to run the firmware update batch file just in case our Zoom Floppy does not have the latest firmware on board. According to this, the device already has version 8, which is what is contained within the latest OpenCBM package, and I somewhat expected this since it's a newly purchased Zoom Floppy. Thus, I will press the Any key to continue, and we're done. Now, before I go any further, I am unplugging my Zoom Floppy from the PC. The next thing I want to do, of course, is get my actual Commodore Drive hooked up and see if it all works. However, you are not supposed to hook up your disk drive while the Zoom Floppy is powered, hence why I just unplugged it from the PC before continuing. The OpenCBM User's Guide has a prominent warnings section, including a proper power-on sequence to avoid causing damage to your equipment. It's really not as complicated as the screen of information in front of you may at first glance make it seem. Essentially, Part of the reason why the Zoom Floppy doesn't require any external power is because USB as well as the Commodore serial bus both run on 5 volts. However, whereas USB was designed for hot plugging, the Commodore serial bus really was not. Therefore, when hooking up your equipment, make sure your Commodore disk drive is switched off. The first thing you do is use the serial cable to connect your Zoom Floppy to your Commodore disk drive. The last two things that you do are connect your Zoom Floppy to your PC with the USB cable and turn on your Commodore disk drive. Similarly, when you are disconnecting your equipment, the first two things that you do are number one, turn off your Commodore disk drive and number two, disconnect your Zoom Floppy from your PC. 
Having hooked up my Commodore disk drive and then powered it on according to the correct power on sequence we just discussed, I'm now going to type in the command which checks if everything is working, and that is CBM control detect, which should detect any devices that are on the serial bus. And it fails immediately. And this is because Windows has no idea where to find that command. Truthfully, I expected that this was likely going to happen, and it does not mean that the installation failed. The collection of OpenCBM commands were installed onto C drive in this folder here, Program Files, OpenCBM. The more eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that during the installation process, right before we put in the USB drivers, we got a message on screen saying that OpenCBM installation had succeeded, but we needed to add this folder to the system path so that Windows could find the commands. The reason I didn't simply do that right away, however, is that that contradicts what the OpenCBM manual tells us. According to the manual, the installer drops a shortcut onto your desktop, which launches a command prompt that has the OpenCBM path installed. Well, as it turns out, no such shortcut whatsoever was installed onto my desktop as part of the installation process, so it seems that the on-screen information given to us by the installer is in fact correct, and we do need to add this folder to the Windows system path so that OpenCBM will work. To add a folder to the system path, search your start menu for Advanced System Settings, which should open this box here. From here, making sure you are on the Advanced tab, open Environment Variables. Under your System Variables, click on the Path and click Edit. This shows you the folders that are part of your system path currently, all we simply need to do is add a new one. Here, we add the OpenCBM path. Click OK, click OK again, and click OK again. Back at the command prompt, which I have closed and reopened so that it picks up the new path, we will once again try our CBM control detect and lo and behold, we have a 1571 disk drive detected as device number 8. We should also be able to run CBM control reset, which just successfully reset the drive, as well as CBM control status. Apparently, the status command does not default to device number 8, so let's try this. This is, by the way, the same 1571 disk drive that appeared in my previous video, peeking inside the Commodore 1571. Check that out if you'd like to find out more about the internals of the drive itself. One of the advantages of using a 1571 with a zoom floppy is that the software knows how to take advantage of its fast serial transfer speeds. Your other option for high-speed copying is that you can take a 1541 drive and hack a parallel port into it. My understanding is that using an unmodified stock 1541 over the serial port with this device runs at the approximate speed of watching paint dry. With everything working, it's time to make a virtual disk image, and for this we are going to use the OpenCBM D64 copy command. There is another command with OpenCBM titled image copy, which is meant to be a more versatile command that not only can create D64s, but also D71s, D81s, etc. From what I've been reading, however, it is under development and not as stable. Therefore, if you know that you are copying a 1541 formatted disk, it appears that D64 copy is the command to stick with 
for better reliability for the time being. The parameters of this command are very simple. The first parameter is the source, which is device 8. The second parameter is the destination, which is going to be test.d64. And it seems as though we are now successfully copying a disk. One thing to note about d64 copy is that it can also be used to take an image file and write it back to a physical floppy disk. To do this, you simply flip the parameters. If you put a file name first and a device number second, it will assume that you want to take that disk image file and write it out onto the floppy disk that is inside that device number. So it's best to get your parameters in the correct order when using this command. I'm going to let this finish so that we can see it complete in real time, given that it's almost done. And there we have it. Test.d64, 174,848 bytes. Now, despite how quickly and successfully that ran, we are still dealing with one major limitation here, and that is that this software is making D64s. The D64 file format is what I would call a virtual disk image, which means that, yes, it is a container file that emulates a floppy disk insofar as that it lays out the information inside of it in the same structure as you would expect to find it on the disk that it's trying to emulate, However, it is not what I would call a true disk image, such as a G64 or a NIB file, which records the actual GCR pulses off the surface of the magnetic media. The D64 copy program, as great as it is, is therefore really just a modern supercharged version of the standard disk copier program that you had back in the day. It works excellently well for copying your data disks as well as any non-copy protected program disks. However, any copy protected retail disks that you try to make copies of using it will probably be just as broken as the copies you tried to make with a standard disk copier in the 1980s. If you were indeed into this back in the day and you wanted to make working copies of your copy protected retail software for um, <clears throat> backup and archival purposes, you probably remember very well that what you needed wasn't a disk copier program, it was a nibbler. So let's go and get one. Here we are at the website of the Commodore 64 Preservation Project, c64preservation.com. Click on the Nib Tools option on the menu at left, and then click on the link that says you can always download the latest binary builds here. From here, download the 64-bit or 32-bit zip file, as is appropriate for your version of Windows, and once you have that zip file downloaded, extract it to a convenient folder of your choice. Once you've decompressed NibTools into a folder of your liking, you will see that it contains a number of utilities. The NibRead utility is the nibbler that's going to nibble our floppy disks. It does have a certain hardware requirement, though, in that you will require either a 1571 disk drive or a 1541 disk drive with a parallel port hacked into it. Unfortunately, the serial connection on a stock 1541 simply is not capable of doing the burst nibbling that this software demands. To nibble a floppy disk using NibRead's default settings, you simply type NibRead plus the desired destination file name, such as test.nib. The resulting nib file will contain the 300 and some kilobytes of GCR data that will be recorded off the surface of the disk. 
If you want your disk image collection to be as small and compressed as possible, you can alternatively specify an extension of NBZ, which is a compressed NIB file. NBZ files can be substantially smaller than their corresponding NIB files, and even smaller than the equivalent D64 file if there is a lot of empty space on the disk, for example, which makes it highly compressible. For this example, however, we will simply stick with the default NIB format. And now for something you'll really like, I'm just going to let this burst nibble run in real time, because if you thought D64 copy was fast, apparently NibTools achieves a level beyond. Now that's what I call fast. You'll notice it slowed down a little bit on the track numbers above 35, probably because most Commodore discs don't have any data at all written in those non-standard tracks, and it's not quite sure what it might find there. If we look at what we got, there is our 300 plus K nib file plus a 3K log file that was created alongside of it. Reportedly, Nibread has about a 95% success rate in making copies of original protected master disks. That said, it has a lot of additional optional command line options, which are far beyond the scope of this video and I will not get into here, but in the event that you don't get a working nib file with the default settings, you may need to do some further investigation and tweak a couple of those options. If at this point you're sitting there going, that's great, but how the heck do I use nib files with my 1541 emulator? Check out my previous video on how to use nib disk image files, and it will tell you everything that you need to know. In the meantime, if you found this interesting or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. Also, if you are getting into devices such as the Zoom Floppy and you find that you have any original master disks of software that simply doesn't seem to be out there anywhere, please consider nibbling those disks and sending the images into projects such as the C64 Preservation Project, which is working hard to study and archive this segment of computing history. Thank you for watching.